the silage choppers in her county, in her area, were running two weeks earlier than they've ever run before. And it was almost too dry then. And that was two weeks ago. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. Always a treat to have you along with us as we look at, at uh, ag-related things and the ag-related markets, you name it. And uh, today is no different. I want to remind you, make sure you go ahead and like these videos. Make sure you subscribe to the videos by clicking on the bell icon down below and share these videos with others as well. And uh, thanks to you, we keep growing this audience more and more and more. Thank you so much for all the help in uh, sharing these videos. Today, I call on Eric Relf of Comstock Investments to help wrap up the week. And not only the week here, Eric, but we wrapped up the month, the trading month, that is, as we get ready for uh, next week. Next week, we come back and, well, shazam, on Monday, it's Labor Day. So no markets on Monday. It's going to be a short trading week to kick things off in September. As we came across the finish line on Friday, I'm curious to see if you look at this as the glass half full or glass half empty. We had some benchmarks that everybody was watching on corn and soybeans. So how do you read it? Was it a good, a good close or not? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Why do you say that? Well, so the what we really wanted to do was we wanted to close above 401 in the December corn. That would have been a weekly reversal on that December chart. And so looking at the weekly chart, had we achieved that, that would have been fantastic. We closed at 401. So technically not a, a reversal, although we did tick above 401 during the trading session. So I think most are going to look at that as a, as a positive, but it really would have been nice to just close even a half a cent higher to trip some of these algorithms into buy-in as we get into the, the next trading week. But <clears throat> 401 will take it at this point. Now, the question is going to be, are the funds going to be active sellers again to start next week now that we're past first notice day and into the delivery period on those September grain contracts? They've already positioned themselves out of whatever they wanted to be out of for the September. Now, are they going to re-enter with those shorts and these deferred contracts? That's going to be the big question for next week. Yeah, exactly. And um, now we have a three-day holiday weekend to rest think about everything and there could be a lot of stuff that happens over the long weekend as well could be geopolitical stuff could be a change in the weather forecast yeah. and uh, as we headed into the weekend there were chances of maybe tropical weather development too that might head our way in the next week or so so there are a few things to keep an eye on and i just wondered how much options come into play now with that kind of um that kind of an attitude around the grain markets right now. Yeah, I, there's there's a ton of different things to focus on. And and the soybeans settled today at $10. Everybody want to see it close above $10. We settle at $10 in the November contract. So again, technically, there's not enough to really feel excited, but it's like, okay, that looks pretty good. Now what? And, and and I'm afraid we've got inputs from both directions when you look at the now what, because, you know, last night we had an inch of rain here in Royal Iowa up to the Iowa Great Lakes. And I've talked to people down a few counties, tiers, few county tiers south of us, and they had three quarters to an inch. Some had a half inch, some had an inch and a half. So uh, and and that system kind of moved across to the east, built as it went. And a lot of people received some rainfall out of that last night. Now it's moving continuing moving east and developing more south. So you've got people in Missouri and like yourself, Marlon, in the in the Tennessee, Kentucky area looking for rainfall tonight. And so how widespread will that be? How much is that going to benefit the bean crop that's in the ground versus what kind of logistical nightmare are we going to have on the Mississippi if we don't see enough to create enough runoff to raise the Mississippi water levels here in the next week or two? And, and so it's again, it's a tug of war, and which side's going to win? Well, and, and you mentioned conditions here in the Mid South region, uh, where I'm located, north of uh, Nashville. And I I will relay to everybody that uh, we had three days straight of 103 degrees or more in this area. In fact, my dash in my truck yesterday, driving down the road, said 107 exclamation point. I mean, it was it was <laughs> hot. And uh, Eric, I was just telling Eric right before we started recording this that uh, I was driving up into southern Kentucky yesterday. I don't mean to give everybody angst or anything, but I did see about an 80-acre cornfield already gone. I mean, they're out there. They're starting to harvest already. Yeah. Eric, 
I have a hard time believing that even if we did look at the glass half full and how we closed on Friday, my gosh, within a week, we're going to have a lot of corn coming to market. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind also is that the choppers have been running for a while. You know, I, I actually have clients uh, in your old stomping ground right along the Nebraska, Kansas border. And, and one I was talking to today, she said uh, the silage choppers in her county, in her area, were running two weeks earlier than they've ever run before. And it was almost too dry then. And that was two weeks ago. So there's some interesting developments as far as what the quality issues might be, even when it does come off. But the they are taking high moisture corn up to 22% in her region right now. I thought that was pretty significant. So that, that should attract some of that earlier harvested stuff that's maybe a little too wet normally, but they're willing to uh, eat the drying cost and, and get it in quicker so that they can get their hands on the grain. So a lot of different dynamics here. Uh, I talked in some of our premium content earlier this week that there was a ethanol plant nearby that boosted their bid late last week, only gave a three day window to get it delivered, but uh, that attracted corn from three different states and, and of course, dozens of counties. Uh, and so there, there are several that are running into issues with supply and getting that procured ahead of harvest here. So again, tug of war, who's going to win? And you had to be quick on the trigger to take advantage of that, right? Yeah, that's right. They flashed it and you had to, uh, you had to contract it on Friday only, and you had to have it delivered by Tuesday of this week. So you only had a few days now, granted they were open Saturday and Sunday, but still it was, it was a massive undertaking to try to get that supply built back up to buy them time to get to harvest. And word that I heard was that there was only three days of supply left when they put that flash bit out there. My goodness. Okay. So uh, you really have to be alert for marketing opportunities right now. Yeah. But uh, once we get into full swing of harvest, um, then what? I mean, yeah. you know, I look at 401 corn as we headed into the weekend there. I mean, realistically, how high can corn get before we get through harvest? Yeah, yeah. Well, you can you can throw a dart at a chart and pick a number, and who knows if we could get there or not. But the reality is, is I th I think that the areas that have ample supply aren't going to get any help from bases. Here in our area, we will get help from bases. I have to believe we we had we just have too many problems out in the fields. I I can go to a field three miles from where I'm sitting right now that went almost 300 bushel last year, and it's estimated right now at about 140. And so the the lack of supply in this area will definitely bolster basis. But how how widespread are the problems? You know, you've got hailed out regions, you've got droughted out regions, you've got flooded out regions, and and do they constitute any more than a basis shift in those immediate areas right now? Probably not. So what's the overall country look like? Are we going to be above 181 or 182? like the USDA would like us to think, are we going to be closer to a 180 or maybe even a sub 180? If that's the case, then who knows where we end up with this thing, especially with the increased ethanol demand that we've seen of late. So immediately, I would say we'd have a hard time contracting anything at higher than a four and a quarter Chicago board. And we're cheating that a little bit with some official recommendations, but something like that would be in the cards in the short term. But that's only if we can keep the funds from piling back into the shorts next week. Now, I keep thinking back to the trip you referenced here. That was, uh, what's that been, two weeks ago when you were in yeah. southern Nebraska, northern Kansas? Something yeah. Something like that. And you had made the comment when I talked with you back then that you were surprised at how many soybean acres there were, especially in Kansas, where you normally don't see them. Not exactly sure what all the reasoning was for that this year, but there was a lot of them. Now, Okay, so we talked about the fact that there are a lot of soybean acres. There's a lot of soybeans around where I am, too. Now, I take you back to where we've been over 100 degrees this past week. Last week, we were all commenting on how terrific the soybeans looked around here uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee. Changed, With all the didn't heat, it? I drove through there yesterday, and those same fields are just dying off like you wouldn't believe and starting to drop leaves already. And I personally can't help but wonder how many pods are being aborted just because the plants just cooked out there, yeah. just instantly fried. And I don't know if they were quite ready for that yet, you know? Well, and that's what you'll, and you'll end up with a lot of pods that may have been nice three bean pods that end up producing two BBs, you know, uh, that kind of thing will go on a lot. But yeah, and, and we're hearing about that in a lot of areas. Uh even here, you know, we had that wet early season and a lot of the lighter soil looked fantastic because it was able to breathe a little bit. 
And as I, I I'm working on my private pilot's license, and as I fly over some of these lighter soil fields, um, you can see when it turned dry, they didn't have enough root system to do them any good, and they just died right then. And and we didn't even have the extreme heat; we just had the dry. And that was enough to do them in. And so, yeah, you're going to see a lot of that all over the place. And what looked like a potential for a 54 bushel bean crop may only be a 51. Uh, and that changes things a bunch when you're talking about a soybean carry number. And so, you know, there, there's a ton to figure out here. And what's the timing of that going to be? And are the funds going to be ballsy enough to stick with this all the way through spring and and, and ride this thing out? And unless the USDA gives us something, some different guidance in a January crop report or a, or a September quarterly stocks report or something along those lines. September is usually a little early for it, but you could certainly see something by January. And what is this? I look at the charts and my goodness, we have a, a week over week higher close in the wheat. Wow. Yeah. Where'd that come from? Paris milling wheat flipped around and that for whatever reason, the U.S. markets have just been following that Paris contract around like a lost puppy dog. It is just unbelievable how that has been going on lately, both down and up, depending on what that Paris is doing. I, I'll actually pull something up here and we'll take a peek, but I thought this was pretty astounding when I started catching notice of it happening. Uh, here we go. Paris, <clears throat> it'd help if I was on the daily. Paris milling wheat traded sharply lower last week, sharply higher this week. And then you flip over and look at like a December Chicago contract, sharply lower last week, sharply higher this week. And it's not much different for the hard red KC, quite a bit lower last week, sharply higher this week. But one thing of note is I've got several moving averages up here, some more significant to people than others, but regardless, you closed above those in, in KC. Chicago, you're right at the top one that I've got, at least on this chart. I've got other charts that I can't really share as easily, but uh, you know, this is, this is big stuff. You get a little bit of follow through to the top side from here and you've got something going on. Spring wheat just exploded and, and, and really cleared all the hurdles, at least in the short term. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's stuff going on. That's, uh, technically pretty impressive. It's not I just heard, the I had heard rumors over the past week that, uh, there were some producers starting to buy back wheat that they thought maybe they had taken a big enough bite out of that market, you know, for the time being. And mm -hmm. it has fallen several dollars, I guess. Um, so, I mean, that looks pretty good on the chart, doesn't it? Um, the yeah. risk reward ratio should be pretty good. Yeah, you would think. I mean, obviously you've got to risk the lows. And it's pretty defined here. Uh, there, it's not like there's no risk associated that uh, a dime or 20 or 30 cents in grains is not nothing when you're talking about a 5,000 bushel contract, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's defined and it's just whether or not you want to tolerate that risk and take a step in there. But, uh, you know, all of them have similar setups. It's just varying degrees of movement. And the soybeans are always the biggest. You know, you step into the beans right now, you're talking about a 60 year plus, 65 cent risk, something along those lines. Uh, the corn's always the least. Uh, from here, you're talking 15 cents and the wheat's somewhere in between. So, yeah, it's but it's defined and that's not a not a common occurrence especially of late i'd always heard over the years that uh, many analysts consider wheat a trendy market mm -hmm. it, it likes to trend and and go a, a long stretch before it turns around again if that's the case i mean this might be a, a good start or at least an indication that it might be starting yeah I, I think you've got one step in the right direction it's just whether or not we can get any momentum now you haven't taken out trend line resistance yet, although you have taken out some moving averages. You had a really nice looking week and all these things, but you take out some some trend line resistance and and actually reverse course on these charts and, and it will it will look good. And wheat can definitely be a leader when it comes to the grain complex. Uh, you know, we always talk about oats knows where the corn goes. Oats are so thinly produced anymore that wheat kind of has become one of those precursors to what some of the row crop activity will look like. By the way, what happened with uh, spring wheat this week? I, I think the yields have been largely disappointing. We've heard a lot of stories about the wheat actually sprouting out in the fields and the grains just not there to carry off the heads. 
so I, I think there's enough of that going on that it really just exploded. Okay, I want to ask you about the livestock. They actually closed on a pretty decent note, the way it looks, uh, as we put a bow on the month of August in trading. Now, how does that set us up as we head into September now? You know, the hogs are... <laughs> The hogs look good. The chart looks good. The The trade activity looks great. I, I'm just concerned with regards to the hogs about without the cash follow through, is it a real move or is this just a, an odd opportunity that we've actually driven these markets into extreme overbought territory and, and we've seen multiple days of, of gains in these futures contracts. Is this just another opportunity to put some hedges on and, and lay some risk off or are we going to see any kind of follow through? I tend to think that at least short term, we're, we're probably looking at a market that needs some kind of a downward correction before it can get legs again. And then we'll have some bigger hedging opportunity a little bit down the road. But the, the hogs right now look really good. Again, just need that fundamental follow through. Weekly export sales this week were fantastic. 42,000 tons of pork sold. That, that, that's what we need. We need that weeks four weeks on end, not just a, a one-off week here. And hopefully we'll see that. That was, I think, 59% above the four-week average on those weekly sales. In the case of the cattle, I don't think it was much more than some profit taking. Box beef is seasonally declining. Uh, it, it's pretty strong tendency for box beef to slough off when we get the uh, Labor Day demands met. And, and we're seeing that this year. Um, Cash cattle is not going to be impressive either. Uh, we're, we're looking at steady in the south, one to three dollars lower in the north, and probably have somewhere around a one and a half to two dollar lower weighted average on a nas nationwide basis by the time we get the actual data Monday afternoon. But um, right now, not a lot to hang your hat on in the cattle, other than the fact that that the futures are at a deficit to the cash, but basis is always present too. So we just have to see where we're at when the October contract comes through. Now, one thing about the October lean hogs, I believe that's at least four days in a row above the 200 day moving average on the close now. And on uh, cattle, they're just trending just under the 200 day moving average. They can't seem to get their head above water. And uh, it's going to continue to be a battle between that spread the way it looks. Yeah, that's a fact. And, and you know, people can point to the overall economic outlook as an indicator of what we can expect moving forward. And if that's going to be the case, at least if you believe the rhetoric, then that would benefit the pork and be a detriment to the beef. And maybe that's exactly where we're headed. I know I've heard comments uh, in recent days that uh, the pork all year long seems to be trading contra seasonally. Is that true? Yeah, it really has. Um, and, and it's been surprising how much we've been able to keep the beef demand high, even with higher prices. And I mean... If you're to the point where the president and the campaign people are talking about the price of beef, you would think that would spook people a little bit. Maybe it has to some degree other than the futures market, but I'm talking about at a retail level with, with the, the general public. Uh, but uh, so far, I mean, we really haven't impacted beef demand and that, that is unusual. But I think that the, the other thing that we've seen is we haven't seen a lot of, uh, the BL, the typical BLT season demand that we would see, we saw it earlier. So to, to your point about contra seasonal, normally we would be coming to the end of BLT season sooner than later. And here we are selling massive amounts in the export market. Are we going to have domestic consumption to match that? That would then be contra seasonal as well. So yeah, it, it's a lot of unusual activity on the pork itself. So when do we get the next Fed announcement on interest rates? And if they would happen to cut them, like most people think they will in September, what kind of impact do you think that might have here on livestock? I, I don't think that they're going to do anything in September that's really going to have any impact on the livestock. Everyone is expecting a quarter point cut. I think that's what we're going to get. The, the Fed has been really transparent all along, uh, going back to 2020 when when most people started listening every time they spoke, uh, they've been pretty transparent about what they want to do and what they intend to do. The thing's going to be moving forward. Are we going to continue to cut rates even more? And what is that going to look like if we do? And I'm not talking about another quarter or half a point. I'm talking about another full point or a point and a half over the course of 2025. Something like that could make a real difference. And I think that would 
actually bolster prices. You know, you mentioned earlier about uh, some of the commentary you put on our premium uh, section. And uh, by the way, everybody can get that access to it for just a dollar for a trial for the first month. Uh, I believe off and on you make reference to the fact that the uh, upcoming planting season is uh, almost already getting underway in South America. And I, I'm guessing you'll be keeping tabs on that and keeping us posted on what's going on there too, right? Yeah, you know, we're we're pretty fortunate that we have direct contact through our uh, president of Comstock, Matthew Cruz, who is married to a Brazilian woman. And so all of his in-laws are Brazilian. They're all farmers and they're very tied in. And Matthew was uh, also operated a, a farm operation in Brazil for several years and still maintains a lot of his contacts. So weekly, we give a pretty in-depth look at what's going on in Brazil and what the progress is and what the cash prices are and a lot of different angles of what's going on in Brazil that I think gives us a unique perspective. Yeah, I'd uh, highly encourage everybody to check that out. I mean, for a dollar, you can't go wrong. And we're getting into that time where, um, you know, the weather could have a big impact down there. We're going to have to shift our focus that way again. Eric, thanks for talking with us. Good stuff. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a long a uh, happy extended holiday weekend that you can enjoy. And then we'll get back to work on Tuesday. Uh, just a quick reminder, you said that we will trade on Monday night. Is that right? Monday night, normal open, 7 p.m. on the grains. Okay, on the Globex trade, we will have trade Monday night. So don't yep. forget that. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Thanks again for joining us. I hope you have a good weekend out there. For producer Brianne Hendrickson, I'm Marlon Bowling. And we'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.